Hi, I'm Jamie Quinn. Welcome to One on One. Today's episode is all about using your talent. I'll be sitting down with one of Canada's most versatile guitarists. He's been touring since the 70s, recorded albums, and basically made music his life. When he's not on stage, he's doing business. He's got a label, a recording studio, is a magazine columnist, and a teacher. Stay tuned to find out how award-winning musician Rick Emmett found his beat in the music business. Well, I'm sitting here with Rick Emmett, award-winning musician. Thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Hopefully, you'll be able to share some of your secrets to success. Okay, I'll try. Your latest album, Good Faith, tell me uh, about how that differs from your other albums. Well, um, I, I started this little label called Open House back in uh, the mid-90s uh, and then went through a, a whole series of different records where I was sort of exercising demons. So I did a classical guitar record, a blues record, a jazz record. And the latest one that I had done before Good Faith was called Handiwork. It was all instrumental. Uh, some of the tracks made it onto smooth jazz radio, those kinds of formats. And, uh, and I had, I've always been relatively eclectic. So there were things like Irish jigs, you know, those kinds of things. But uh, for Good Faith, I'd, I'd stockpiled a few singer-songwriter kinds of songs, and I was really in a mode where I was listening to a lot of James Taylor and Sting, and so I, I wanted to do a singer-songwriter kind of record. So that's what it is. It's it's eleven songs. They're all singer-songwriter tunes. There's very little focus on the hands. It's pretty much all. And lyrics. you wrote the songs. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Well, let's start about how your career got started. Like I said, you have been touring since the 70s and uh, a founding member of Triumph, which has international recognition. Was Triumph the first thing you did? Well, no, no. The first thing I did was uh, join the school choir when I was about eight or nine years old. <laughs> no, um, I've been performing publicly uh, since I was about you know eight or nine. I was in the church choir and the school choir, and that's where it started. But uh, before, you know, uh, when I was in high school, well, I guess when I was about 16 or 17, I was uh, playing three nights a week in a country and western band out in Pickering, the Robin Hood Inn. And um, so I had more money than anybody in high school because I was getting paid 20 bucks a night. Ooh. But, and I was playing in, I was like a jobbing guy when I was a teenager. And because I could sing, I would get the front, like, bar mitzvah bands and wedding bands and that kind of stuff. So I did that uh, for a while and had my union card and away I went. Would you call um, that paying your dues? It's no, well, it was a beginning of it, but I, I would have been perfectly happy to have a whole life, a whole career at that level doing that kind of stuff. I just loved the fact that I had a guitar in my hands and I could sing and I could play. It. But uh, I think uh, part of the sort of the formula for me, the success formula was that I was also a writer so I could write tunes, and so I would have these original bands on the side, and that would be kind of going along. And then I was also relatively uh, at ease with the whole show business aspect of things. Like, you know, will you wear tight pants and wiggle your butt? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I, the first actual real kind of professional band I was in that became relatively recognized was, was a singer named Justin Page from the Toronto area. And he had to deal with Capitol Records. And, I got a gig in that band, and I used to wear, you know, makeup on my face and black lipstick rolling down. And I had a costume that was a, a woman's gym leotard, that that had a stuffed white glove in strategic place, and I was well known for that uh, costume. <laughs> and what what year was that? That would have been seventy two, seventy three. Yeah. Was that something everyone was doing at the time, or just you? Well, everyone. I don't know. I mean, there was the whole uh, Alice Cooper, yeah. David Bowie, Lou Reed, glam rock kind of thing, and this was a, a sort of a Canadian version of that. The record went nowhere, and I only stayed in that for about a year, and then I started a, a progressive rock band called Act Three, and we toured Ontario for nine months, ten months, something like that, and then I was playing at a club in Toronto, and the guys from Triumph sort of came and made me the offer, and I moved over into that September of 1975, played my first gig with them. And how many years did you tour with Triumph? Uh, I was in Triumph from 75 until 88, so uh, 13 years, and uh, it was a heavy touring band. But it, we didn't, 
we weren't the kind of band that sort of went out for a year and a half and we were out every single day. You okay. know, uh, I mean, I was married and we were raising kids and we tried to sort of structure it much in the way a traveling salesman would, where you, you, you maybe go out on a Wednesday through Sunday, come back for a couple of days and back out you go again. Uh, and the, the longest we'd be away was maybe three weeks or four weeks at a time, and then we'd come back for a while. It, it, the being in a trio was a very good thing economically. It was uh, it was good. It's the you can still have a band, but it's the least amount of people you can have and still call it a band. And because of that, in the early stages especially, we didn't uh, tour with tour managers and a huge entourage. We just went out by ourselves. And you booked your own acts and that sort of thing as well? Uh, well, we had agents and things, yeah. but we didn't have to have the, you know, the, the hand holders and the road manager and this guy to mm -hmm. book you into hotels. and that. We just did it ourselves, you know, and so it, it saved money and, and uh, it also made it so that it was easier to fly out and fly back and fly out and fly back. It wasn't like we had... Uh, you know, some gigantic jumbo jet with 52 people in it that we had to worry about. Well, what, what will they do if we go back home on Monday through Wednesday? You know? Would you still describe it as a somewhat glamorous life without the jet? Oh, tremendously glamorous, yes, sure. Holiday ends, no. It's, uh -huh. it's completely the opposite. You know, it's incredibly boring. And the, the lifestyle is, and you know, I, I can't remember who said it, but, you know, I mean, you spend you know, 22 hours kind of just going through the motions and then you get that great, you know, 90 minutes on stage and then back we go to the boring routine again, you know, and you can sort of put repeat marks around it and this is how your day goes. You know, you get up in the morning and you try and get some breakfast before you got to get to the airport and then you fly and then you get to the, and then you get in the limo and the limo takes you to the hotel and you check in. Then you got to get over to the sound check and then you got to go over to the radio station and do an interview and then you got to go back to the hotel and hope to get something to eat and hope to get a nap before you go back to the and get up there and play the gig. Yeah, 90 minutes and then back to the hotel, you know, dressing room, go and do the meet and greet. Hey, radio guys, thank you very much. Go back to the hotel, try and get four or five hours sleep, get up the next day and do it all again. And it's day after day after day after day of that. And that's why so many guys end up becoming drug addicts. <laughs> because they're going, I can't do this anymore. I, I need a vacation, even if it's only in my head. Were there drugs in your scene at that time? Um, not for me. Yeah. I, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons I've been a survivor. You know, um, when, when you sort of buy into the lifestyle and the, you know, the image that gets projected by cameras is one of glamour and guys start to believe that they're something that they really aren't hmm. and they think that they're sort of bigger and stronger and more amazing and more talented than they actually really are and then they think they can get away with anything mm -hmm. so they figure they can yeah I can do these kind of drugs and I can you know live this kind of lifestyle and, and they end up going down a road where they c the music's not important anymore or it, it loses I I its place of value was that a problem for your other band members? Was that something that led you apart? Um, well, you know, uh, I think that uh, the way I would deal with that question is that I would say that we had lots of differences. There were artistic differences, there were philosophical differences, there were ethical differences, there were moral differences, there were political differences. I think I've covered the spectrum, haven't I? Sure. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, what I wanted out of a career in music was not something that Triumph could give me. And it started around 83, 84, 85, and it was uh, not an easy thing to get out of. So uh, it took till 88 for me to sort of get up my courage and say, see you later. You so know? what was it that um, you can do and you're doing now that you weren't doing then? Um, well, <laughs> for one thing, you know, writing every single song and being the producer of every single song and, and uh, uh, you know, not necessarily having to submit the work to a, a democratic kind of committee, uh, not necessarily having a major label A&R man or manager leaning over your shoulder going, you know, I really think it should be red instead of purple, mm -hmm. you know, and you feel well, you know, I'm glad that's what you think, but this is my process and this is my stuff and I think I'd like to make those decisions for myself. So. I would be the first to admit that probably that's an egotistical kind of thing, but you know, um, I think art sometimes has to be a very personal kind of thing for it to be any good. And the more that it sort of becomes work by committee, 
the more it can get watered down. And it seems you're always taking on new projects. Um, you're combining different genres, uh, known for your mix of flamenco, jazz, swing, pop, you name it. Uh, you seem to combine those with ease. And and that's probably something you didn't get the chance to do, just doing the same thing all the time. Yeah, the, there, Triumph certainly tr tried to give me uh, a little bit of latitude. But most people sort of just thought of me as that guy up there in spandex pants, moving <laughs> his butt and having flash bombs blow off and, you know, playing hard rock. And they just figured, oh, yeah, there's Angus Young ACDC and there's Rick Emmett to try. You know, you go, well, no, I, you know. And what about your uh, instrumental guitar trilogy? Uh, tell me about how that project came to that be. That was when, when Open House Records first started. And it was really a question of, uh, I had done three albums for Duke Street Records, which was distributed by uh, Universal in Canada. And they had been attempts to sort of be mainstream rock records. The guy that used to be in Triumph is now, you know, trying to be successful at radio in Canada, blah, blah, blah. And I'd had a, my fill of that. It was just at a point where I went, you know, I, I really, this doesn't seem to be working anymore. And, you know, at that point in time, it was the, the grunge era had kind of run its course and Kurt Cobain had swallowed a shotgun and all of these kinds of things had happened where the world had changed. So, you know, what did they want with a guy that was in his 40s, you know, trying to pretend that he was still relevant to rock, you know. So um, I thought, you know, I've always uh, felt I, was, I had a classical guitar record in me, an instrumental classical guitar record. So I thought, you know, I, this is the time to do it. If there was ever the time to do it, this is it. So I did that. And then, you know, there wasn't much point in shopping it around to major labels. They weren't going to sign anything like that. So I just went, if I could just find a major label to give me a production and distribution deal. So that's what happened. At EMI that said, Dean Cameron, the president there, said, yeah, sure, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll manufacture them up for you and you can go and sell them off the stage and, you know, you'll be lucky to sell a thousand of them. Well, good luck to you. Did you sell a thousand? Yeah, we sold a few thousand, yeah. It went all right. Good. <laughs> it was good enough that I felt like, hey, I got this little business here, I got this little label, I got this thing going, maybe I'll do a jazz record. So that's what I did next, was an arch top jazz kind of swing thing. And then I thought, yeah, you remember... Yeah, you know, uh, first basement band I was in, and all those Yardbirds guys, Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton and the Blues. I'd like to do a record like that. So that was the third one I did. And I thought, you know, that's kind of covered the spectrum of where I started out as a teenage guitar player. You know, I've done the classical, I've done the jazz, I've done the, the blues rock. Right. And so... Well, that sort of became the trilogy. And I okay. thought, okay, now it's time to go back to trying to make a <coughs> singer kind of record again. Right, so. and that's good faith. Well, I, 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 there were some records in between. There was the Live at Berkeley, which was kind of, uh, went down to Berkeley College and did something that was a, an amalgamation of that, that trilogy and then a few little things that I'd done. And then uh, I did a Christmas record with Sam Reed, the guy from Glass Tiger, and uh, that was all traditional Christmas carols. Uh, and then we did Handiwork, which was the smooth jazz record, <clears throat> a little bit more grown up. Uh, but I was writing songs at that point in time, and it was just I had this accumulation of all this instrumental stuff, and instrumental records are a little easier to put out and mix than, than singer ones. So <laughs> singer one came So it later. seems you've covered the spectrum. I mean, what could you do next? Um, I don't know. Okay. Feel like making a record? <laughs> Anybody here want to make a record? Maybe. I, I'm getting a lot of invitations, uh, okay. which is great. Uh, playing on other people's records, uh, doing sessions, and as far as my own stuff goes, you know, we'll, we'll tour on the Good Faith album, and we'll see how it goes at radio. We'll see if we can make international deals for it. Maybe make an American deal, and uh, I think it's the kind of record that deserves more of a mainstream kind of kick at the can than anything else I've done before uh, at, in the open house thing. So. At the, you know there isn't there isn't anything on there that's too weird so weird that it couldn't get played on radio or couldn't have videos made that might get played on you know much more music or whatever but um, I'm not going to hold my breath for any of that I'll uh, I'll run the course of trying that sort of promotion marketing thing because in the end that's really what it boils down to it's all about marketing and promotion it's not really about necessarily the the quality of the content more 
is the content such that it allows itself to be able to fit into this little nice demographic slice and get hammered through, you know. Do you find that frustrating at times? No, I just think that's the reality. You know, okay. I, I, I teach a, a music business course at Humber College in Toronto. Um, you know, one day a week I go in there and I lecture to young idealistic jazz musicians and I just say, you know, this is the way it actually works. You know, this is the way the business is structured and I mean it's evolving, it's changing at the speed of, you know, light through a fiber optic cable, you know, it's a digital world now. So what are your words to wis of wisdom rather to your students? Well, you know, I don't know. I just stand up there and babble and I, I just hope that there might be a word of wisdom here and a word of wisdom there and they might be able to put them both together and make something of it. Um, I, I think it's really important that people see themselves as, as uh, entrepreneurs, you know, independent contractor kinds of, you got to have your own little website, you got to have your own mindset as to what it is that you do and uh, the, the, the metaphor that I often use is and it's, it's much like a, a baker who has this little bakery uh, and it's not even on the main street it's off on some side street somewhere and um, it's a hard life it will be a, a difficult it won't be easy you know this is not going to be about being a rock star and having somebody come and you know giving you a million dollars so that you can live the life of Riley you're gonna have to get up really early in the morning you have to you know bake that fresh stuff and have it on the shelves for 6 a.m. because the clients that you have will come to you because that's what they want, your fresh stuff on the shelves. The, the, the words of wisdom for a, a young act would be, you got to be able to uh, evolve and you've got to be able to, you got to be light on your feet, you got to be able to change directions and, and uh, you have to have a kind of a flexibility that's built into your creativity so that you can go in directions because, you know, the, the, the momentum shifts mm -hmm. and, and the culture changes so rapidly that you, you have to be able to go with it. And what has been um, your hardest point in your career and your la biggest challenge? Well certainly um, making the decision to leave Triumph was, was a huge thing um, and it took me a few years to get to the point where I had the courage to do it and I did have you know very close friends say to me are you insane? What are you doing? You know, how can you walk away from that? And then I had other people that said to me, um, no, of course what you're doing is, you know, what a tremendously courageous, amazing, brave thing you're doing. And I said, no, it's, it's neither thing. You know, it's just, it's a natural, organic thing that I, I just feel like I have to do. And I'm not doing it to try and be brave, and I'm not doing it because I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm just doing it because I feel like I kind of I kinda have to. Um, so th that I grew up a lot then and then I think I grew up a, a lot in the last four or five years well, I've got four kids and they're sort of at a point now where they're independent and you know the oldest one's gone off and, and uh, how old are they my, my eldest is uh, 21 now okay she's in her third year going into her fourth year at the uh, Faculty of Music at the University of Toronto and uh, She's a ter uh, terrific musician, and I think she wants to be a teacher. She'll, she'll be a good one. Uh, I have twin daughters that are uh, 18, and they're just getting out of high school. They're not uh, musically inclined, but they're, they're uh, fantastic people. I'm really proud of them. And my uh, youngest boy is f uh, 15, going on 22. Okay. Pre pretty mature, pretty... <laughs> pretty together kind of kid. And, and he's, is he following in your footsteps at all so far? Uh, he plays trumpet, but I don't know if he's going to necessarily be a musician. Uh, I had a lot of jock tendencies when I was young too. I played a lot of sports and uh, I just wasn't big enough and strong enough. One of the uh, things that sort of altered my life path, career path, was that when I was 17 I blew my knee out really badly playing football and I had already broken wrists and ribs and you know, all kinds of bones and things, playing sports. But I loved baseball and football and, and basketball and volleyball, and I ran track. And, um, so my son has inherited some of that uh, competitive uh, sports ambition. H having those kids, you know, be, being, a, uh, being a, a husband and being a father, th those were big things that changed how I went at my career, you know, because I had those things as priorities. Were you able to manage both, and how did you do that? 
Um, <laughs> I think if you had my wife sitting here, she'd probably say, well, yeah, sometimes he managed and sometimes, you know, I had to slap him up the side of the head a little. Um, you know, certainly uh, she did an amazing job uh, putting up with uh, the demands that my career would make. The traveling and the not necessarily being there and uh, uh, but I think we did all right and I think the kids turned out pretty darn good and um, you know I don't think that there's any kind of secret to it I think it's really just kind of common sense you know mm -hmm. that really it's just a question of balance all the time you know do you feel like you've got equilibrium and that you feel balanced when you get out of balance then you have to say okay whoa stop you know wait reality check how come uh, this just seems so out of balance so uh, I think because there was always that kind of common sense approach and I had a really good woman there to you know kind of hey you know you know what they say behind every great man yeah yeah <laughs> and and it's not just the woman but it's also you know the parents that you've got and the, and the kids that you've got let's talk about your parents how did they feel when you were growing up and said you wanted to be a musician were they supportive <laughs> I don't know uh, I don't know how they felt originally, but my my impression was that uh, my father thought I was insane, uh, and that my mother thought it was a kind of a good idea uh, that I should chase my dreams. But uh, shouldn't I have some kind of you know law degree to fall back on? Kind sure. Of thing? Yeah. Uh, which was you know sort of the, the 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 tenor of the times. You know, I think all parents kind of felt that way. Mm -hmm. But um, I, you know, I'll say this. My dad, we, we used to load up the Rambler with the PA and the amps and the guitars from Rodeo. My dad would be the roadie. He'd drive us to the gig, you know, where we were going to get paid 20 bucks. So. Now, your career, would you say, you know, it's it's just beginning? Would you say you're midway through your career? Um, well, I turned 50 this year. So. Are you going to keep going strong? What are your plans? I, th I think I will. I think yeah. I'll, I'll uh, you know, I, I love the... I love the process you know I love writing and I love playing and I love sitting in a studio and grappling with the muses you know I, I, I enjoy the process uh, I like writing uh, prose poetry uh, those kinds of things so you know I got sitting in my hard drive there's a bit of a novel waiting to get finished and short stories and things and you're also a cartoonist I was for a while you know I haven't done drawing for a long time uh, but yeah I was published in some magazines back in the early 80s and I think part of it was you know I've had a lot of nice things happen to me in my life because I was the guy that was oh he's that rock band guy mm -hmm. you know I mean I wouldn't be teaching at Humber if I hadn't been that rock band guy you know and I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you if I hadn't been that rock band guy. So I never would have got the chance to be a cartoonist, probably. If and columns as well? Uh, yeah, I wrote for Guitar Player Magazine for several years, uh, thir I guess 12 or 13 years. Never would have got that offer if I hadn't been the guy in the rock band. You know, So one thing opens a door somewhere else, and, and you know, I just kind of keep going through those other doors and seeing how it, how it goes, and I've been lucky. Guitar Magazine said that you were probably more talented uh, too talented for my own damn good. That's it. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Do you think that's true? Uh, no. I, 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 well, let me say this. First of all, I think that, uh, again, coming back to this thing of common sense and balance, humility is very important. You know, you have to have ego. You have to believe that, that you're good enough to do the job. So, uh, too talented for my own damn good? I think the context is important there. I think what they were saying was, you know, this is a guitar magazine guy writing. So he's saying, look at this guy. He sings and, and, he, and he, he writes. He's not just, you know, Joe Perry in Aerosmith up there who needs uh, Steven Tyler out there or, you know, Jimmy Page in Led Zeppelin who needed Robert Plant. You could be a one-man show. You are a one-man show. And But, yeah. And I think that I've been lucky that I was able to do those things. I think it's one of the things that allowed me to have the career that I've had, that I was not just a single threat, but a, more of a sort of a triple threat kind of guy. Now, that's not to say that I think I'm a way better singer than singers or a better guitar player than a guitar player. I, you know, no, I'm, I'm humble about that. You know, there's lots of guitar players out there that are way better than I am. You know, I got kids sitting in my class at Humber College. They're already better guitar players than I am. You know, but can they sing as good as I can? 
<laughs> or can they write as good as I do? You know? And do they have the wisdom? Yes, and that's that's a huge thing too. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you know, experience should count for something. <laughs> You're the recipient of the 2002 Mississauga Arts Award as well. And uh, I do know that you live in the city. And how is it living here and uh, producing music? The region of Peel, definitely not as big as Toronto, let's say. Yeah, but this is a, you know, I mean, I love this city. And I've lived here since 1979. And, you know, there's a tradition here of, of uh, support for the arts and great arts. I mean, you know. Uh, Oscar Peterson just kind of lives, you know, a stone's throw away. And in the neighborhood that I live in, there's there's musicians like Doug Riley and and uh, Mike Francis is a tremendous uh, studio session kind of guitar player guy that lives a few blocks from me in my neighborhood. So I mean, you know, you don't have to go very far to find uh, really talented people that are doing great stuff in in this town. And it was a, it was a nice honor to get. You know, it's nice to you know, be climbing on an airplane and flying off to some foreign country and come back and find out that, you know, the people in your neighborhood are kind of going, hey, you know. That's where it all starts. Yeah. Right that's, at that's, home. That's a nice thing, you know, and, and um, I, 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 it meant a lot to me to get that award. That wraps up this week's episode of One on One with musician Rick Emmett. Rick, thank you so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. See you next time.